This is Thinking Through the Word. Today we're in 1 Samuel chapter 16. We are working our way through the Bible, book by book, taking one chapter from each book to look at each week. So take a look at 1 Samuel 16 if you haven't already. And now let's share together some of our thoughts. Remember, we're looking for something to see, something to ask, and something to do. And hopefully some of my observations can enhance yours, and perhaps you'll have other things that I haven't even pointed out. 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king? This rejecting points us back to chapter 15. Uh, So you could look back there and see the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yet another failure of Saul that the prophet needs to confront. And he tells him, the Lord has ripped the kingdom from you and will give it to another. Well, God's question to the prophet is, how long will you grieve over Saul? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite and look at this, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Think of it. While Samuel is grieving, stewing, trying to figure out what is God doing? How is this kingdom going to continue? God is reminding him, I, I've already done something. I have provided for myself a king. And from the very start of this story, we realize God is always accomplishing his plan. He's got things under control. And sometimes we just need to hear the Lord ask us a question. How how long are you going to stew on this before you turn in faith and believe that I have this under control? So from the very start in verse 1, we see a helpful principle for daily living. God has everything under control, even when we don't see it. Now, we come to verses 2 and 3, and these verses have stirred up some angst in uh, readers because it seems that God contributes to this matter of deceit. Samuel says, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. So if, if Samuel's going to anoint another king while Saul is still the king, Saul's not going to like that. So the Lord says, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. This raises this question of, well, is this deceitful? I think what we see first and foremost is that what Samuel says is exactly what he does. He comes to make a sacrifice. So as you wrestle through that question in these verses, just note carefully what is said and what unfolds. Uh, That's going to be a help to us. Uh, Might not be all of the resolution. Uh, You may need, need to do some other thinking, but don't miss that portion of the text. What's interesting is that the plan is to have Jesse bring all of his sons so that Samuel can anoint one of them. And as those sons come, we see these words entering into Samuel's mind. When he looked on Eliab, the firstborn son, he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Surely. And what's our next word? It's a word of contrast. Uh Uh-oh. Suddenly, the surely word is going going to be offset by the Lord said to Samuel, no, I've rejected him. He's not the one. Makes us stop and think, wait a minute, our, our confidence can only come from what the Lord says. See, this was what was in Samuel's mind. He was sure in his thinking that this was what God wanted. But no, it wasn't. We are are often more confident than we should be. 
more confident about what we think is right, more confident about what we think we know of someone else's actions and motives, and so we judge them. We are sure in our minds, and how often is it met with the word, but that is not what the Lord thought. What a lesson in confidence. Beware, beware of it. Let our confidence flow only from what the Lord has said. There's a principle given to us. We've heard it before. The Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Just remember, this is the way it is. God can see the heart. But there's also a warning here not to be so focused on the outward appearance that we never look for any signs or indications or fruit of the heart. We can't see the heart, but we can see evidence of character. So be looking for that. In this case, the outward appearance just wasn't sufficient. And so the sons pass by, second son, third son, Shama, The Lord says, no, he's not the one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And the answer was, no, the Lord has not chosen these. And so that begs the logical question. Verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? Because after all, God said in verse one, I will choose from among his sons. And then in verse 10, it's not any of these So there must be another son. This is the logic of faith in response to the word. There must be another son because God said he's choosing one of them. And he says, I haven't chosen any of these. Oh, that we would be so tied to what God has said that logic demands that it must be true. Are all your sons here? Look at the response. Verse 11 still. There remains yet. Okay, so there is another one. Why why wasn't he included in the others? Why such a reluctance to have this son as number eight in line behind the other seven? Well, there remains yet the youngest, but... Word of contrast, so whatever comes after it is going to discount this. Behold, I mean, look at this, really, you know, can't you see? He's just a shepherd boy. What what an odd account here. Bring all your sons, and he brings seven of the eight, and totally discounts the eighth son because he's young. And think about it, behold, he's just keeping the sheep. And Samuel said, send and get him. We won't even sit down till he comes here. Just a lesson here on the way we can tend to underestimate who God will use. And and we might even do this with ourselves. We might underestimate our own gifts and abilities and say, oh, I could never do that. No, shame on us. How foolish was Jesse to not bring his eighth son when he was told, bring your sons. And how foolish we are to underestimate those whom God may use. How how quickly we forget that God uses the simple things to confound the wise. Verse 12 actually raised a question in my mind. And maybe you would have the same question. After verse 7 Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. We're told that when David appears, he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. Question, why physical attributes and descriptions when we were just told that physical attributes and descriptions were insufficient for choosing the king because God looks on the heart. And yet the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. 
is this a contradiction of verse 7? Well, first, I want us to see that beauty isn't bad. Beauty isn't bad. So when God says man looks on the outward appearance, that doesn't mean that's sinful. That, that we will just never notice something that is beautiful or attractive, pleasant, artistic. So God's not discounting the outward appearance. Verse 7 is simply saying this isn't the sum total of virtue, of character, of leadership. No, that's going to be rooted in the heart. So if anything, verse 12 is just a, an acknowledgement that things can be pleasing to the eye. But what we see secondly in anointing him, this is he, is that in verse 7, God looks at the heart. That's how he's going to be choosing a king. And what we were told in 1 Samuel chapter 13 Verse, oh, I think it was verse 14. Through the prophet to Saul, after one of Saul's failures, the prophet says, God has already chosen a man after his own heart. So, verse 12, though it seems odd with its physical description, acknowledges beauty, but reminds us that the anointing was because David was a man after God's own heart. Finally, we come to verse 13. David is anointed, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And I just want us to close by thinking about what do we know from the New Testament teaching of the Spirit's work in us? We know we have the Spirit of the Lord. Rushing sounds like Acts chapter 2. So in the Old Testament, they received the Spirit of the Lord for the purpose that God had given them. That hasn't changed in the New Testament. Oh, I won't deny there are differences between old and new. But what is certain in the New Testament is that God's people have received the Spirit of the Lord that has come upon them to do what God has asked them to do. So for us, this becomes daily living. We have the Spirit of God in us to empower us to accomplish the task for today. So be encouraged. God's always accomplishing his plan. We might not see it. We might even get it wrong. We might be confident and think we know what we know, and that's just not what God's doing. He looks on the heart. And don't forget that God has poured out his spirit so that we can be successful in what he has asked us to do today. So keep thinking through the word. And as you do, I think we'll find that through the word, we can experience grace and peace.